35 people gather together, or even, you know, 13 people or nine or whatever. Um, those are those are true human souls, and they're going to live an eternity in either he- heaven or hell forever. And so somebody needs to care for those people, and hopefully that somebody is somebody who truly loves Jesus and is humble and gracious enough to, to not make their career into some kind of a spectacle. And those are the guys that I'm trying to really in- commend and encourage in this book who are serving very, very faithfully in whatever context that God may have called them into. That, that is so true. And in that one part of your book, you write, that we ought to be willing to expend ourselves for the proclamation of life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that should be the message. Um, I, I mean, I don't care if you are a pastor of a mega church. Your job is to make sure that the people you are feeding and leading are getting the gospel, whether if you're known or unknown. Yeah, no. that's right. Let me just let me just add one thing here to Brandon is that if any of the listeners are thinking, okay, so I get it, this is a book for pastors of small churches, um, That's there's a lot more to it than that, because as the chapters unfold, and we're going to talk about each one of these a little bit in some of the episodes to come, what you're going to see is, uh, sure, pastors are going to get something out of this book, but it's actually not written for pastors. I am writing for the homeschooling mom just as much as I am the minister. I'm writing for the business person who's trying to bring their faith into their place of employment. I'm writing for the college student that's, you know, considering what they're going to do with their lives. I'm writing for the grandparent that has uh, an opportunity to touch their grandchildren's lives for the good. I'm really writing for everybody, um, not just pastors, but anybody who wants to make a difference in this world and is okay with that difference being somewhat small, unknown, and lightly regarded by our, our secular world today. Man, amen. I totally agree. Now, <laughs> you also wrote your book, and I chuckled when I read it. It says, have we, be- uh, have we become an entire culture of frogs and toads? chanting and croaking our own names yeah (laughs) like i read that and i'm like hmm am i so uh (laughs) so at the very beginning i quote from a famous poem by emily dickinson which Uh kind of clarifies that strange um that strange image of frogs and toads croaking. Um, if you if you don't mind, let me quote the uh, the poem. Yeah, please. He says, "I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us. Don't tell. They'd advertise, you know. How dreary to be somebody. How public, like a frog, to tell one's name the live long June to an admiring bog." And so uh, Emily Dickinson is talking about the same thing I'm talking about here, that there's a contentment in being a nobody, a nobody for Christ. And she compares that to a bog with a bunch of frogs croaking all day long. And what are they? What are frogs doing when they're croaking? They're drawing attention to themselves. Absolutely. Uh, trying to gain a mate or whatever it is frogs croak about, I have no idea. Um, but um, that's kind of what we look like in our social media-consumed uh, age. Uh, you're a guy that's on social media. I am, too. And I'm sure everybody on social media, you know, the kind of the point of it is that you post things that are important to you, uh, maybe articles or pictures, family pictures. I just posted about our new puppy dog we got <laughs> last night on Facebook. And uh, But if you're on social media enough, what you realize is that a lot of people are croaking their own name, and they're constantly... Uh, To change the analogy, they're tooting their own horn, they're bragging about themselves, Uh, they post selfies that are made to look like their lives are awesome and that everybody else could be jealous of what they're doing. Uh, New clothes, new car, new job. In my field, it's new book, new article, whatever it is. Uh, It's, hey, look at me and um, recognize how important I am. And Emily Dickinson, I like that. She compares it to a a bunch of frogs just croaking their own name out in the bog, (laughs) hoping somebody cares. That's pretty funny. Um, I had a a, – I'm not going to call this person a friend. And I'm going to shift gears a little bit, but it still kind of goes into this. 
uh, bragging about the amount of women he slept with and is sleeping with. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. made it made a nasty joke toward me that I'm going to be a 40 year old virgin. Uh huh. And I, right. I told him, I see, you know, there's a difference between the two of us. I know who I am. Therefore, I don't have to sleep around with anyone. You don't know who you are. So you sleep around and find your own gratification. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I'd rather be a 40 year old virgin and keep my soul intact than to sleep around and lose who I am in Christ. Right. You know, yeah. I mean, I don't have to be known by the amount of people I sleep around with. That's disgusting. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, think about the pastor. Pastor, they have mega church pastors that do stuff like this. Yeah, they're known on a national level, but they're also known in other people's beds, if you know what I mean. Yeah. You know, yeah, man. So why are we why are we chasing our own self gratification when we should be chasing and making Christ known and making him the famous one? Yeah, exactly. You know? Exactly. Now a lot of us are a little bit more subtle, and so what we do and I include myself in this, ironically, is we know that it would be too prideful to simply say, hey, world, look how great I am. You know, I'm going to post this picture, this picture of me on Facebook so everybody thinks I'm awesome. So instead, what we've done as a culture is we've come up with this thing called the humble brag, which I, which I also mentioned in the introduction to the book. Yep. The humble brag is when you say something that is supposed to sound like it's humble – but, you know, it's kind of obvious that you're actually bragging. And so I give a couple of examples from a New York Times article about the idea of the humble brag. Somebody tweeted, why do men hit on me more when I'm wearing sweatpants? Well, that's supposed to sound humble. Like, hey, you know, I just, you know, I'm barely, you know, I don't <laughs> even have my best clothes on here. But the idea is, ah, see how attractive I actually am that people would hit on me even when I'm not dressed to the nines. And we do this all the time, and even Christians do this. Um, one of the things that uh, Christian pastors do a lot, and again, I, I can't rip on, you know, I'm one of these guys. I'm, I'm a Christian pastor myself. But it's like whenever, uh, let's say a guy gets a, a chapter in a book or something like that, or maybe he gets to speak at the the Evangelical Theological Society, he gets to give his paper, he always says, I'm so humbled to have been chosen to present my paper at the esteemed ETS conference or something like that. And he said he's humble right there in the tweet, but what is the tweet doing? The tweet is there to draw attention to the fact that he was chosen to give his paper at, at the Great Society or whatever it is. So even we Christians, you know, and uh, and if anybody looks at my Twitter feed, you're going to find it there too. I'm a, I'm a humble bragger. I confess I'm, you know, I'm a sinner in need of grace. But, uh, but the problem is like um, at the end of the day, Am I doing what I'm doing for the glory of Christ, or am I doing it to enhance and to further my own reputation? And it's a trap that we all fall into, and I think I even confessed that at one part. It's either in Chapter 1 or the introduction where I say, hey, look, man, I'm I'm admitting that I used to want to be like one of these guys, these famous pastors. I used to want the same attention that they had, and sometimes it comes across as though if you don't have that attention and that fame – you must be doing something wrong or unfaithful in your ministry yeah. uh, because, you know, they have these conferences and, and you know, we've, we've probably been to some of these conferences before, Christian conferences. Who do they get for the speaker? Well, they get the guy who sells the most books and has the most famous name. And then he'll often get up and, and he'll give a few, uh, you know, talking points about how successful his ministry became. And after a while listening to the talk, you're not sure if he's really talking about Christ or if he's just giving you his own resume. But it almost always carries the the implication. Now, they'll never say it in so many words, but it almost always carries the idea that if you simply do what I did, then you can have as broad, as big, and as important of ministry as I do, too. And a lot of uh, pastors of small churches, like your pastor and like myself, we go to these conferences, and unfortunately, and this is true, sometimes instead of feeling really encouraged, (laughs) we end up feeling bad that we don't have these kinds of huge, you know, broad 
platforms that some of the more famous pastors do. And then we end up kind of beating ourselves up like, well, maybe I'm not faithful. You know, maybe I'm not important. Maybe what I do doesn't matter. And that's exactly the opposite of what I'm trying to say in this book, that you are important, even if you're small and unknown. Yeah. And I remember uh, I was at a general assembly and we had this uh, speaker that spoke and basically said uh, the stuff that you said along the lines of being a mega church and, you know, bringing people to Christ and all that. And I was very uneasy with his entire message. Like he turned me off from listening to him when he made those comments. And I'm just sitting there and I started twiddling my thumbs and I was taking notes. I stopped taking notes and I was like praying that I would fall asleep because I did not like the message, if I could be honest. And when we finished, my pastor asked me if I understood. And I said, yeah, I did. I hated it. And he was like, okay, I'm not the only one. And then after talking to a a bunch of the pastors there, they all felt like it was a slap in the face because Mm. they are a pastor of a small town church and they are unknown on a national level, if you will. So what are you telling these people? What are you telling these faithful men and women that are preaching the gospel? What are you telling them that being unknown is not okay? I mean, is it okay to be unknown? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course it is. Yeah, that's exactly right. Because, um, you know, the, the people that we care for really do matter. And that's the whole idea is, you know, it's not like only the people matter in the big cities. Um, it's, it's, it's not that. It's people in small cities or rural areas. They matter. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, yeah. the people that, that you know, think of if you will, if you're listening to the podcast, think of the the person who sits in the pew in front of you in the church. We could all probably imagine something like that. Um, that woman, that widow, that couple, uh, that college student, they they have a soul that is precious to our Lord Jesus Christ. And you have an opportunity to care for that person, whether you're a minister or not. Even if... if um, you have no particular title or office in the church. Um, you're not. You don't even have to be an elder or a deacon to care for for human beings. You can be a titleless, roleless person and still do incredible things for for the ministry. Yeah. So one of the one of the big you know overarching frameworks of this book, and it's only a hundred pages. It's a short book is that I'm looking at the lives of the people that surrounded the Apostle Paul. I'm not looking at the Apostle Paul himself, because he gets a ton of attention, as he rightly should. Paul is one of the great saints of the Church, one of the truly most important human beings to ever live. Um, of course, Christ is greater, but, but, but Paul is super important, right? But even when you look through the book of Acts— what you find is that Paul was surrounded by a number of lesser-known people, um, that there aren't many Bible studies written about Epaphroditus. You know, there aren't many Bible studies written about Apollos. There aren't many Bible studies written about Priscilla and Aquila. But all of these people were surrounding the Apostle Paul, and they helped and contributed to the early church's ministry in greatly significant ways. So that's why I'm trying to encourage even your average listener who's not a pastor, elder, deacon, just a regular old person, wants to serve Jesus, you can make a difference too. Oh, absolutely. That is so, so true. Now, I want to bring it back to your book. Uh, You have a a, a subtitle in the introduction that says, Celebrity Christianity Not Working. Mm -hmm. Why is that? And I know the answer, but why is that? (laughs) Well, I don't think it's working for a lot of reasons. Um, One of the reasons that celebrity Christianity is not working uh, is because most of the celebrity Christians end up failing at some point. Um, Not only that, but some of them actually cause more division and disunity within the church than they help. Now, there um, there are some celebrity Christians that have been greatly important. Um, I mentioned two, George Whitfield and Charles Spurgeon. Both of those men in their times and days had a lot more fame than most ministers in their in their context. Uh, Whitfield, the evangelist, who was a con- con- 
contemporary with Jonathan Edwards and uh, did his best ministry in the 1740s. He was probably one of the most famous people on planet Earth, honestly. He was known...